benediction. Growing up, I remember seeing this word at the bottom of the church program, and I knew there were certain words that you said at the end of the service that meant it was time to go. But the term benediction was a foreign word to me. Benediction literally means good words. Good words at the end of the service, sending church members out into the world. Like many Christians today, back then, I was uncertain about God's care and concern for the world beyond church. But here's the truth. God is intensely concerned about the world we enter after the benediction in all its pluralism and its division. Each week, most church members work and play among people with competing conceptions of truth, goodness, beauty, and justice. The benediction sends people who believe that Christ has come, died, risen, and will come again into engagement with a complex, diverse society. And that engagement is their true and full discipleship. But how should they engage? I have a proposal. Instead of leaving Christians uncertain or confused in their engagement with this pluralistic world, let's teach them to engage the world with imagination, hospitality, and hope. I first propose that we teach them to engage the world with imagination. Evangelical Christians are committed to God's truth, but sometimes there's an unintended consequence. The commitment to receiving God's truth in Scripture sometimes leads to a un an unhealthy view of imagination, a view of imagination as contrary to truth. The result is that many Christians live in an imagination desert, unable to connect faith and vocation. Many of us know stories of those who are the only Christians in their workplace, Many who inhabit the imagination desert in their workplace, unable to know how their faith connects to their work. How do we awaken their imagination? Above all, we need to help them see that imagination is the friend of truth. To imagine is to work with truth, to envision various ways God's truth can appear in our workplaces. The Faith at Work movement emphasizes the first great commission, the one we see in Genesis 128 and Psalm 8, where we learn that humans are created in the divine image and charged by God to be caring, winsome stewards of the world, especially in the workplace. Ken Myers, the host of Mars Hill Audio Journal, defines culture as what we make of the world. Inhabitants of the imagination desert make little of the world, perhaps content with receiving God's truth, but ignorant or confused about how God's truth connects to the most rest of life. Culture makers work with truth, figuring out and imagining how to make something of a pluralistic world. Kent Johnson is a culture maker. He works as an attorney for Texas Instruments, and he told me that their workforce is like the United Nations. Every ethnicity, religion, political persuasion, and lifestyle. Kent's an evangelical Christian who started a diversity program by introducing voluntary prayer groups, not just for Christians, but for every background, Muslim, Jewish, and more. The leadership recognized that if managers want to understand their workers better and want them to collaborate well, then managers need to understand what's important to their workers and to help them to feel welcome. Now, prayer groups may seem like a typical evangelical Christian emphasis, but this was less about evangelism than workforce cohesion. The result was that a pluralistic environment began to feel like a family. By creating space for religious expression, Kent imagined a way for the Texas Instruments ethos 
to feel like home for a diverse international workforce. Imagine that. Religion as a path to unity rather than division. Emphasizing religion enhanced workforce collaboration. How are you leading people away from the imagination desert? How are you helping future leaders to become culture makers? People who believe that Christ has come and died and risen and will come again, they hear words of benediction each week. Good words sending the people of God into a diverse world ripe for imaginative engagement. I propose that we teach others to engage the world with imagination, and second, to engage with hospitality. Our divided society tempts us to view those with different worldviews or values with suspicion and sometimes hostility. And social media makes it all the more tempting. While the faith and work movement and holistic discipleship tells us to dive into the world of work in the public square, that world out there can be a harsh environment for the expression of a vibrant faith. Returning fire or huddling with our people and avoiding them may seem to be the optimal strategy. But Jesus gives us another path, the way of hospitality. You remember the parable of the man beaten, left for dead at the side of the road? The priest and the Levite just walked on by. But who comes to the aid of this man? One of those despised Samaritans. As he often did, Jesus was flipping expectations, making the Samaritan the hero. The Samaritan is the hero because he practices the second greatest commandment. He loves this stranger as himself. Neighbors practice hospitality. And here's Jesus' point. They don't include exception clauses when they define neighbor. Amy was a nursing student from a fundamentalist background. One Sunday, she was working in the emergency room, and a young man came in who had dived off a bridge to attempting to commit suicide. He was busted up, several broken bones, but survived. Amy was in the room when his father and grandfather came in, and they, they asked the young man why he wanted to commit suicide. He told them he was gay, and he knew they would never accept him. Amy was astonished to hear this father and grandfather call the young man an abomination before they stormed out of the room. She learned from the young man that his father and grandfather were pastors. She said nothing explicit about her faith besides, I'll be praying for you. Like the priest and the Levite in the parable, they may have felt that they had a biblical justification for their response of rejection and hostility. But Amy took another path. The transport people came to take the young man up to a room, and Amy tagged along to see if she could help. When they began to move him from the gurney to the bed, she noticed that in all the hustle of the ER, no one had taken time to wash the young man's legs, still covered with mud from the riverbed he dived into. And Amy got a pail of soapy water and proceeded to wash the young man's feet. Instead of looking down at him with a kind of holy pity, Amy became the Good Samaritan for him. She showed hospitality to her neighbor. In Romans 13, Paul echoes Jesus, reminding us that every commandment of interpersonal relationship is summed up as, love your neighbor as yourself. Don't let selective righteousness give you permission to take the path of the priest and the Levite. Who are the people out there on your pathways waiting to be engaged with hospitality? Are you walking on by? Or do you have a holy zeal for hospitality in our pluralistic world? 
People who believe that Christ has come and died and risen and will come again, they hear words of benediction each week. Good word sending the people of God into a world with pluralistic pathways full of Good Samaritan opportunities. I propose that we teach others to engage the world with imagination, with hospitality, and third, to engage with hope. Andy Lennox saying, dying is easy. It's living that scares me to death. It can be scary in our divided society to think about how to be a faithful Christian in a world where social media has turned up the virtual volume. Each day, Christians work with people with different ideas about things like the size of government, marriage, immigration, the role of religion inside houses, outside houses of worship, and on it goes. Twitter feeds and Facebook posts present a grand chorus of conflict. We easily encounter what others think. This exposure to pluralism can make it seem scary to bring a public faith to the workplace, and despair can set in. But Christians ought not to despair. Yes, it, it is easier to take the pathway of despair and cynicism and gripe about them with our fellow Christians. But our faith calls us to hope, prompting us to carry hopefulness with us everywhere. When Catherine Leary Alsdorf was the CEO in Silicon Valley, she encountered an environment with very few women, many difficult challenges, and she often struggled to abide and lead in gospel hope. For, for Catherine, gratitude became the key ingredient on the path to hopeful engagement. As she grew in thankfulness for the grace and mercy we, have, we see in our salvation, she began to see God at work in her work world. Gospel hope came from growing in thankfulness for what God has already done, becoming more aware of God's action in, our, in the present, and having more and more faith about what God is going to do in the future. Even when it was dire, gratitude was a path to hope. Brian Stevenson is an attorney and the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative. Some call him our Mandela because of his pursuit of justice. His book, Just Mercy, chronicles his vocational path in the Deep South as he took on cases like that of Walter McMillan, unjustly sent to death row. Now, this is no chronicle of easy justice but it's that a narrative with victories and setbacks, along with a great personal toll. Brian encountered an environment where justice seemed to have several different meanings, dependent upon race and class. He, in spite of this, maintained his commitment to biblical justice. And it was a long road, but eventually Brian and his team won freedom for Walter and for many others. He could have been overcome by despair and cynicism in this work, but he held on to truth, to justice. Brian's a man of hope. Hope steers us through these challenging waters. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us, especially in difficulty and hostility. Our hope is in Christ's salvation that reclaims God's world, vanquishes sin and death, and gives meaning to our lives each day. Hope admits that circumstances aren't always going to be in our favor, but it resists pressing the mute button. Do your congregants and students hold on to truth and hope? Do you have gratitude, the attitude that could bring you to hope? Or do you yield to the siren songs of cynicism and despair? People who believe that Christ has come and died and risen and will come again, they hear words of benediction each week. 
Good Word sending the people of God into a divided society desperate for the hopeful antidote to fear, silence, and despair. In a pluralistic world, Brian's pursuit of justice is a walking expression of hope. Catherine's gratitude catalyzed hope. Amy became a good Samaritan. And Kent, his engagement with imagination helped create such an environment of hospitality and hope that when a Muslim employee was distressed at some company restructuring, he welcomed the prayers of his evangelical Christian colleagues. Beyond making our calculators, Texas Instruments is one example of a place where you will see engagement with imagination, hospitality, and hope woven together. Brothers and sisters, we believe that Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. It's our turn to move from this proposal to practice in our lives. Our turn to become agents of engagement in this pluralistic world. Now, would you stand with me for a final word of benediction? <laughs> Hear these good words. May God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you as you engage his world full of imagination, warm in hospitality, and courageous in hope. Amen.